The Space Shuttle Columbia disaster was a fatal accident in the United States space program that occurred on the 1st of February 2003. STS-107 was the name of the mission, and it was the 113th flight of the Space Shuttle program, and it was the 28th and final flight of Space Shuttle Columbia. Columbia was the first orbiter built and flown in space. In February 2001, Columbia had received a major overhaul and updates of its systems, but it was still an aging vehicle. The mission launched from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida on the 16th of January 2003. During its 15 days, 22 hours, 20 minutes, and 32 seconds in orbit, it conducted a multitude of international scientific experiments. During the mission's launch, a piece of insulated foam broke off from the space shuttle external tank and struck the thermal protection system tiles on the orbiter's left wing. Similar foam shedding had occurred during previous space shuttle launches, causing damage that ranged from minor to near catastrophic. But some engineers suspected that the damage to Columbia was even more serious. One of the reasons for this assumption was that the foam debris that impacted the wing struck the shuttle at a relative speed of about 500 miles per hour. Taking that into consideration, it becomes somewhat obvious why engineers thought the damage to the Columbia may have been catastrophic. Before re-entry, NASA managers had limited the investigation, reasoning that the crew could not have fixed the problem even if it had been confirmed. When Columbia re-entered the atmosphere of Earth, the damage allowed hot atmospheric gases to penetrate the heat shield and destroy the internal wing structure, which in turn caused the orbiter to become unstable and begin breaking apart. Cameras focused on the launch sequence revealed the foam collision, but engineers could not pinpoint the location and extent of the damage. Some sources say that the concern the concerns of the engineers were not addressed in the two weeks that Columbia spent in orbit because NASA management believed that even if major damage had been identified, there was little that could have been done to remedy the situation. Columbia was scheduled to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere on the morning of February 1st. Inside mission control, engineers performed all the last minute checks. Everything seemed nominal. Entry flight director Leroy Kane gave shuttle commander Rick Husband the go ahead to initiate deorbit and re-entry procedures. It wasn't until 10 minutes later at 8.53 a.m. as the shuttle was 231,000 feet above the California coastline, traveling at 23 times the speed of sound that the first indications of trouble began. Telemetry indicated that hydraulic fluid temperatures had suddenly gone off-scale low. The sensors measuring the data were all located in the aft of the shuttle's left wing. There was no commonality that could explain the fault, and all other hydraulic system indications were good. Soon, the loss of tire pressure on the left side followed, with the readings again going off-scale. This was already bad news for the shuttle. Columbia could not make a landing while losing tire pressure. Further losses of sensors in the nose gear and main gear compounded the nervous atmosphere in mission control. Then, all communications from Columbia ceased abruptly. Patchy communications were expected during re-entry, but not just pure silence. All efforts from Houston to hail Columbia failed. Even the radar used to track the shuttle did not spot anything. The shuttle's trajectory was aimed to perfection, so there was no reason or possible way that it could have been late. Because the heat-resistant tiles covering the left wing's leading edge had been damaged or were missing, wind and heat entered the wing and blew it apart. The first debris began falling to the ground in West Texas near Lubbock at 8.58 a.m. And at 9 a.m., the shuttle disintegrated over Northeast Texas near Dallas. Reports were coming in from Texas, which lay along Columbia's descent path, of people spotting fireballs and falling debris from the sky. There were no doubts left. Space Shuttle Columbia and crew were lost. Lock the doors, remarked Flight Director Kane. It was a standard procedure to cut off contact with the outside world and keep all information within the room. Making the tragedy even worse, two pilots aboard a search helicopter were killed in a crash while looking for debris. Strangely, worms that the crew had used in a study that were stored in a canister aboard the Columbia did survive. The mission was the second that ended in disaster in the space shuttle program after the loss of Challenger and all seven crew members during ascent 
in 1986. In August of 2003, an investigation board confirmed that a large piece of foam fell from the shuttle's external tank and breached the spacecraft's wing. The investigation also revealed that the problem with foam had been known for years, and NASA came under intense scrutiny in Congress and in the media for allowing the situation to continue. The report also went on to claim that it in fact would have been possible either for the Columbia crew to repair the damage on the wing or the crew to be rescued from the shuttle. The Columbia could have stayed in orbit until February 15th and the already planned launch of space shuttle Atlantis could have been moved up as early as February 10th, leaving a short five-day window for repairing the wing or getting the crew off the Columbia. After the disaster, space shuttle flight operations were suspended for more than two years, as they had been after the Challenger disaster. Construction of the International Space Station was paused until flights resumed in July of 2005. NASA made several technical and organizational changes to subsequent missions, including adding an on-orbit inspection to determine how well the orbiter's thermal protection system had endured the ascent, and keeping a designated rescue mission ready in case irreparable damage was found. Except for one mission to repair the Hubble telescope, subsequent space shuttle missions were flown only to the International Space Station to allow the crew to use it as a haven if damage to the orbiter prevented safe re-entry. The remaining orbiters were retired after the International Space Station was finished. By May of 2003, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board released their working scenario for the accident. The board determined that at approximately 81 seconds after a 10.39 a.m. EST launch on the 16th of January 2003, post-launch photographic analysis determined that foam from the external tank left bipod ramp area impacted Columbia in the vicinity of the lower left wing reinforced carbon-carbon panels 5 through 9. While on orbit for 16 days, neither the Columbia crew nor the controllers on the ground had any indication of damage based on orbiter telemetry crew downlinked video, still photography, or crew reports. When the vehicle began re-entry, this damaged section of the wing was subjected to extreme entry heating over a long period of time, leading to carbon panels 5 through 9's erosion. Severely slumped carrier panel tiles and substantial metallic slag decomposition on the carbon panels, nearest the damage area. The destruction of the wing from overheating caused the breakup and crash of Columbia. It was a tragedy that cost the lives of seven astronauts and the spacecraft. The loss of both Columbia and its crew signaled the beginning of an important policy update about the future of human spaceflight.